We want to welcome Ann Cornbluth. The book is called Notes from the Crack Ceiling, Hillary Clinton, Sarah Palin, and What It Will Take for a Woman to Win. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Let me begin with uh, what you begin early in your book. You say 2008 turned to be just the opposite for women, a severe letdown with damaging consequences. It revived old stereotypes, divided the women's movement, drove apart mothers and daughters, and set back the cause of equality in the political sphere by decades. How? There had been, or at least there had been a perception before this election that there was some kind of a unified front among women, at least within the Democratic Party. There wasn't a bipartisan women's movement necessarily, but at least the Democratic Party was united. And when you go back and look what happened, Hillary Clinton did win a lot of women, as, especially as the Democratic primary wore on. She won older women, but she split younger women. And when Sarah Palin was on the Republican ticket a few months later, she was not able to bring over Democratic women or um, even very many independent women, as they had suspected they might be able to. So rather than there being a groundswell of a, of a kind of a women's movement, what I look at in the book is the fact that it really splintered generationally across party lines um, and even among women elected officials, some of whom went for Obama, some of whom went for Clinton. Let me take you and our audience back to June of 2008 when then-Senator Hillary Clinton withdrew from the, the race and endorsed Barack Obama. This is from here in Washington, D.C. Although we weren't able to shatter that highest, hardest glass ceiling this time, thanks to you, it's got about 18 million cracks in it. <laughs> And the light is shining through like never before, filling us all with the hope and the sure knowledge that the path will be a little easier next time. Anne Kornblut, outside of giving you a title for a book, uh, what did that moment mean for Hillary Clinton in talking with her and others around the Clinton campaign? Well, it was the culmination of the campaign, obviously. It was the final speech, and by a lot of people's reckoning, her best. Uh, it was the first time in the campaign where she talked about gender in a specific way. And if, if you go back and you sort of think about all of 2007 and the half of 2008 when she was in the race, um, she always would start questions about being a woman running for president by saying, her answer would always start with, I'm not running because I'm a woman. She would always say, I'm not running to be the first woman president. Um, her campaign and some of the reporting I did really grappled with this question of whether they should give a gender speech and ultimately concluded they shouldn't. They um, had talked around it, talked about it, and then when Barack Obama, of course, gave his landmark speech on race, they said, well, there's no way we can talk about gender now. But that, that final speech, which was, in many people's view, her best, really was the first time she tapped into, talked about what it would have meant if she had won and been the first female president. So much of the campaign, it was about what it, was, it would have been to have the former first lady be the president or a Clinton be president again. You write in the book, the casual approach was stunning. Unlike the Clinton's campaign's epic internal deliberations over how the public would perceive a woman in high command, the McCain camp made a calculation based on gut feelings and vague electoral math that, of course, leading to Sarah Palin as the VP nominee. They really did a surprisingly little amount of research in picking her. Now, you have to remember what was going on in the campaign at this point. Obama looked as though he were going to be ahead after winning the nomination in 2008. McCain looked around the landscape and said, okay, who can I pick? Uh, Tim Pawlenty was on the radar screen, Mitt Romney. He really wanted to pick Joe Lieberman, where there would have been some obvious downsides, and he was warned there might be a revolt at the convention if he did that. They looked around the political landscape and around the country and said, well, here is this hot, and I use that term meaning in every respect, young female governor of Alaska. They didn't have a chance to vet her as fully as perhaps they would have liked and might have been wise to do, but they picked her nonetheless. And they, what they didn't think about, it, obviously in hindsight, are some of the pitfalls that women candidates all over the country experience. One of which, one of the main ones, is, is that they are scrutinized uh, for their credentials and often are challenged about whether they're actually experienced enough to run. And of course, that's what happened with Sarah Palin. Later this year, Sarah Palin will be speaking at the first Tea Party convention. What does that tell you? That she is not uh, going away, necessarily, and although some people would like uh, her to. Now, is she going to run for president? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. She certainly would have a right to, given that she was on the ticket last time. 
And uh, at this point in time, with, given what the Republican field looks like, it wouldn't be at all surprising if she looked at that and said, I've got as good a shot as anybody. And her book, of course, remains uh, in the New York Times bestseller list. She did make a number of media appearances, including the Oprah Winfrey Show, in which she was asked about what you write about in the book, her interview with CBS's Katie Curry. I have a vast variety of sources where we get our news to. Alaska isn't a foreign country where it's kind of suggested it seems like, wow, how could you keep in touch with what the rest of Washington, D.C. may be thinking and doing when you live up there in Alaska? Believe me, Alaska is like a microcosm of America. Now, obviously, you've read books and magazines. Why didn't you just name some books or magazines? Well, and obviously, I... I have, of course, all my life, right? I, I, I'm a lover of books and, and um, magazines and newspapers. By the time she asked me that question, even though it was kind of early on in the, in, the, um, in the interview, I was already so annoyed, and it was very unprofessional of me to wear that annoyance on my sleeve. But was I was it like, that you couldn't think of any in the moment? No, or you were... it was more like, are you kidding me? Are you really asking me? It, to me, it was in the context of, do you read? How do you stay informed? You're way up there. It seemed like she was discovering this... A nomadic tribe, a member of a tribe from some Neanderthal cave in Alaska, asking me, how do you stay in, in touch with the real world? That's how I, I took the question. So I kind of, well, didn't kind of, I did. I rolled my eyes and, and was annoyed with the question and thought, you know, I think that this is a problem with the state of journalism today, is no matter what I say to her, it will probably be twisted, perceived okay. as, as a bit negative. Ann Kornblut, what was happening within that campaign? during that moment? Well, even that early on, I mean, she noted how early in the campaign it was, there were divisions within the McCann campaign. They started almost immediately, within a couple of weeks after she was picked. Um, I mean, it's interesting. She says she was annoyed with the question. Uh, of course, politicians get asked annoying questions all the time, things that they think they shouldn't have to be um, asked or answered. And she was asked that at that point. But the same was true in some of her debate preparation in getting ready for some of her interviews. Some other McCain aides uh, who I interviewed uh, after the campaign was over said she just refused to prepare and built up a lot of resentment within the campaign uh, and a lot of hostilities broke out that we still see to this day. She went, I mean, the, provided the title of her book, Going Rogue. That was her attempt to break away from what she felt was the McCain shell, the McCain bubble, and their sense that she had just gone off completely off the reservation, that they had all but made a mistake in picking her, and that she didn't understand what it took to uh, run for the vice presidency. What was interesting, I mean, my, my book, I look very specifically at some of the gender aspects of that, and she too failed to understand that by not preparing for some of these interviews, any misstep she might make, she was going to have an added layer of criticism and questioning. She just was. Uh, she was young. She was a woman. These were all new things. And she was going to have to, whether she liked it or not, answer what books and magazines she read, prove that she was actually qualified, even though she'd been a governor. That itself wasn't going to speak for itself. And that wasn't something that she or even the McCain campaign seemed to fully appreciate until it hit them. We'll get to your calls, uh, your email comments, and your Twitter comments. It's uh, cspanwj slash, or twitter.com slash cspanwj. In the book, though, just along these lines, you say that she grew increasingly nervous, in fact, spooked about the position she was now in and conscious of the gaps in knowledge she had not known and since, as, in essence, she began to start losing her bearings. It's interesting. She didn't have that many allies in the McCain campaign by the time it was over, but I was able to find a few. And their sense was that she came into this campaign incredibly confident and confident, if not in her, n her mastery of everything, knowledge-wise, her at least her ability to perform and to wing it on the stump and to be charismatic. And that over time, especially with the Katie Couric interview that you just played, she started to really lose that natural talent. Something about being in the national glare, which she'd never obviously been in before, being inundated with criticism, being ridiculed by Tina Fey, that all of these things started to add up so that even the most fundamental questions would unnerve her. And we did see that somewhat as the campaign wore on. Bob is joining us from uh, Granger, Indiana, Republican line with Ann Kornblut of the Washington Post. Good morning. Good morning. Say, this is interesting. You start the program out with uh, two leftist journalists. You end with a leftist journalist, and I can prove this. And anything that this woman would say about Sarah Palin is not credible at all. I mean, these are MSNBC hangouts. The first two people you talked about were MSNBC hangouts. Well, Carla, I, 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 you know, I, I have to disagree. Uh, Bill McInturf is well, a Republican strategist. I don't strategist care what you have to do. I mean, you, the New York Times, they review 
this, uh, what, this Brzezinski gal, the book review, how many books is Beck, O'Reilly had, never been reviewed by the, it's just a bunch of leftist garbage. Mm 